Thank you so much. Thank you so much. So we're in the book of Hebrews, or the letter is a better way to say it, in a literary sense. And uh, an author is unknown, there's lots of speculation. One of my favorite is that Priscilla wrote it, um, and there are great academic debates on that, which is beyond my pay grade. But um, what we do know, Tim Mackey from the Bible Project says there are two primary ideas that drive this letter. The first is the superiority of Jesus, which sounds so arrogant in a pantheistic world. In a world of many faiths, many spiritualities, many ideas, philosophies, the notion that Jesus is superior seems to sound so dreadfully arrogant. The second big idea, says to Mackey, is that it's to challenging, challenge the reader who were predominantly Jewish Jesus lovers who were scattered through the persecution. Think for a moment of Kabul. Think for a moment of what happens when, remember Jerusalem fell in 73 AD, just after the, uh, after the death, there was the scattering of, of Jews, but preceding that was the persecution of the Jesus lovers. And they were scattered all over the world. And this author had this deep affection. That's why I think it has a strong maternal feel to it. It's this mother pleading with her children who are persecuted, who are scattered, who are vulnerable, lonely, isolated, connected. We, the family I was speaking about um, in, uh, in uh, the nation that's crumbling right now, or at least limping right now, just answered prayer. They, they were in hiding in one part of the city, and they were taken to another part of the city in the middle of the night, and the prayer was, God, let there be no roadblocks. Now, anyone who knows anything of what's happening in that region knows that is an impossibility. And there were no roadblocks that night. God works in mysterious ways. And so the author plays with these two ideas under a literally cyclic approach, meaning he, will, he or she will say something and then repeat it and then repeat like you say to your kids. And it's not you disgusting children, why do I have to speak twice? It's because there's a journey of growth and maturity, and sometimes we have to be reminded of some things. And so the cyclic rhythm is to remind us of the things that matter. Chapter 2, Hebrews chapter 2, verse 1. Give careful consideration to your ways. Think about these things long and hard. The second thing I want to say, just by way of introduction, is the tragedy of the familiar. The tragedy of the familiar. Um, Meryl and I have been married 40 years. We were laughing with T about that last night. Met her when she was 15, married her when she was 18. Let's get this done with. Let's move on with life. And 40 years later, we still love each other. But the temptation is familiarity. The temptation is to play on the known, the things that irritate you about me, the things that I know about you, the lack of wonder and mystery and curiosity and who are you and can I find out, can I I go below, below the surface into the deeper essence of your being. What drives you? What motivates you? What, uh, what, what celebrates you? Meryl turns 60 in January, and we are going to party, but she's not going to know, see? Because there's mystery and wonder and surprise and curiosity in marriage. That's how we roll. Isn't that right, Meryl? Thank you. Now, what happens with the gospel is the tragedy of the familiar. We, we do Easter. Easter eggs, Easter bunnies, we, 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 we chase Easter eggs for reasons I do not understand. We, we have Christmas and we have babies and a teenage girl holding a newborn and, 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 and camels and, and kids that behave poorly and everyone is moved sentimentally by it, but there is the tragedy of the familiar. It's no longer about the death on a cross. And as I was mulling over this, I was reminded of the passage that blew my mind. See, I think every one of us will have either that passage or that moment or that story or that message or that worship set where the gospel impregnates you and you have to fight that to resist the ongoing work of Jesus in your life. And for me it was, I was about 18 or 19, as some of you were, and I just failed my first year at college, um, at party too much, quite simply, and I went home defeated first time in my life that I'd really lost at anything. And it was an incredibly humbling thing to go home and tell my folks, you know, all the money you spent for me in this private liberal arts college, well, I've just screwed it up. And this was the passage. 
when I felt so defeated, the shame of letting my family down, uh, the first son who'd ever gone to college because I come from a blue-collar family. My dad had spent, he was a construction man, and he'd spent so much money getting me to this private school, my school that pulled uh, strings to get me into this college. And in that place of great defeat, of just wondering what on earth, I read this, praise the Lord, O oh my soul, all my inmost being, praise the Lord. And suddenly I was reading not a hymn, I, I was kind of periodic in the Methodist church, and you know how it goes, they have hymn 475, and then the preacher would get up and say, we'll sing the second and third verse today. And I think, why on earth did they write the others, because we never sing them. But this was different. This, this was a different moment. Praise the Lord, O my soul. He is speaking to his soul. He's addressing his soul. And he's saying, what I want you to do more than anything else is I want you to praise the Lord. And forget not all his benefits. I knew an austere God, a God whose finger was on my face because of my own error and misdemeanors who forgives all your sins, and I'd accumulated enough to carry shame, and, and my head, my chin was in my chest with the, 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 the awkwardness, oh God, if anyone finds out what I've done, what, what, what would they think of me? Who heals all your diseases. Who redeems your life from the pit. This wasn't a preacher talking to me. This wasn't an old-time Pentecostal evangelist raving and raging. This was me sitting by myself on my bed in my parents' home who redeems your life from the pit and crowns you with love and compassion. That's what I needed. I needed to know, to know that somewhere in my brokenness, love and compassion would be a crown that I could wear because I was deserving of nothing. Who satisfies your desires with good things, not your dreams. Dreams are too shallow. They're too limited. They're too small. Your desires. Somehow, somewhere in my own dark and darkness, there was a little, a little tree, a little, a little plant that was beginning to break through the blackness of my soul. So that your youth would be renewed like the eagle's. When the tragedy of the familiar begins to creep in on me and I'm no longer astounded with wonder and mystery at the cross, I read this. The Lord works righteousness and justice for all the oppressed. Being in South Africa, that meant something to me. Apartheid where black people were suppressed and oppressed, beaten down, killed in prison. He made known his ways to Moses, his deeds to the people of Israel. The Lord is compassionate and gracious. Why are you saying that that's not the God I know? That's not the God that was preached to me. The Lord is compassionate and gracious, and he is slow to anger. I didn't know that world. I was an angry man. I grew up in an angry home. A pounding in love. I won't go into all of this. He does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. I needed to hear that. I sat there and read it over and over and over again. This was not a text of shame. It was a conversation of forgiveness. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, this is the verse that caught me, so great is the love, his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far he removed our transgressions from us. That was the defining moment when I knew I could never turn my back on Jesus. I'll read it again. For as far as the east is from the west, so far he has removed our transgressions from us, and I did not believe it. You cannot do that. 
I know you can splash my life with a touch of mercy, but how dare the songwriter say, says that God will separate me from my sins, I was a geography teacher, as far as the east is from the west. But as I read that and fought my way through the power of the gospel and landed with this incredible image of God holding me in the nail-scarred hands on the one hand, and on the other hand, it was the sins which I had committed, the iniquities, transgressions, to use big Bible words, on the other, and he said, I will never bring them back together again. And every time something pops up that I did when I was 14 or 18 or whatever, I said, no, 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 no. As far as the east is from the west, he has separated me from my sin. He will remember, Isaiah the prophet says, my sins no more. That is the mystery and the wonder of the gospel that keeps me preaching it with all of my heart. I will not, dear friend, suffer from the tragedy of the familiar. I cannot, because such is the wonder and mystery. I can carry on reading as a father has compassion, etc., etc., etc. When the gospel becomes the tragedy of the familiar, can I ask you to find that moment and relive it? Go there again. Is it a song? Is it a text? Is it a story? And go back there. We cannot allow our souls to be gospelless. We cannot posture ourselves to simply sing songs because it's what we do. It's in my soul the need to worship. This passage, Hebrews 9, has three fundamental movements. Like theater, if you wish, or music. The first is the tabernacle, the second is the blood, and the third is the sacrifice. The tabernacle, I'm just going back to Hebrews here, is something that we don't understand, do we? Every little Jewish boy or girl would part of their growing up, and we read our books to our kids but to the, certainly the orthodox believer, the orthodox Jewish family, they would hear about the tabernacle. It would be familiar for them. For us, it's our kind of when we have our study Bible with the extra pages. There's like this little sketch of a tent and like a little fence around it. And we're like, cute. But I don't know what that means. I have no idea what it means in my life right now. It, it, it doesn't make any sense whatsoever. So what do we do with it? Verses 3 through 6 says, Behind the second curtain was a room called the Most Holy Place, which had the golden altar on the incense and the gold-covered ark of the covenant. And this ark contained, and then it describes. Well, what does that mean? Well, what does that mean to me? Verse 7 but the, only the high priest entered the inner room, and that only once a year and never without blood, which he offered for himself and the sins of the people had committed in ignorance. The Holy Spirit was showing by that way, or by this, that the way into the most holy place. Sorry, I read that really badly. <coughs> What can we take from it? Time doesn't allow me to go into all the symbolism, but I think there's a message in there for us, and I think it's this. There were really three spaces in the Holy of Holies. There was kind of the outside of the tent area. Then there was kind of the, 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 the tent to the Holy of Holies. And then there's the Holy of Holies, this inner tent where only the high priest went once a year and they would tie a little string to his leg in case God zapped him and they could pull him out because no one else dared go there. Now, if this has been a cyclic letter with repeated truth. If this has been a letter to the Hebrew Jesus lovers who are scattered throughout the world, what is the author trying to say? I want to suggest it's an invitation to worship. If we take those three spaces representing those three groups of people, I want to suggest that within our communities, there are those on the outside they are the, maybe the inquisitive or the unbeliever or the pagan or the skeptic, but who will watch and not engage. Curious. 
Why do you Christians do this? Liverpool Football Club is my particular soccer team that I love supporting. And last season, like all sports teams, there were no fans in the stadiums. But yesterday and today, they started the EPL, English Premier League, and stadiums are full. Now, I've loved Liverpool's from about 1980-something. But one of the things I love about them is they actually sing a hymn. You'll never walk alone. And they all lift their hands. And 60,000 people, all in red shirts, will sing a hymn over their team. See, we were designed for worship. We were designed to lift our hands and praise. And to the non-Liverpool person, they may be, wow, that's a pretty cool team. And they got a German coach who's actually a Jesus lover in between the F-bombs he throws out. But, but he, I'm told, has a great walk with Jesus. It's just language, just translation. <laughs> But, but you see, right at the outset, there is the curious and the skeptic who stands there at a distance watching. Might even be moved slightly, but doesn't engage fully. And then there's the next area, kind of the area between the Holy of Holies and where the temple courts are. And that's the believer who is offering up a praise... But what's missing? Well, if we read the passage here, it says this is an illustration for the present time. This is an illustration for the present time, indicating the gifts and sacrifices are offered. So what makes this central community of worship different from those? Well, what the writer of Hebrews says, it's an illustration. We bring our gifts and our sacrifices. See, you can't go beyond that. If by gifts you are not bringing in your resources and your finances. You know that. Throughout the text is woven the spirit of generosity, not because God needs money, but because we can't let money be our God. And so one of the beautiful things in worship is that they come and bring it to God. One of the things I love about Africa is they take that seriously. And so worship, I mean, uh, the offering is not a basket passed around glibly. It's baskets up here. And people will, in worship, Hallelujah, Hosanna, Hallelujah, Hosanna. And they would come with their coins and their notes all frumpled up and the wealthy with their checks. And they would come and deposit it and sing back, Hallelujah. Why? Because worship is gift giving. It's opening our sticky fingers from the things that want to control. The Merrill and I were sitting, we had a date night the other night, went out for happy hour to the cannery. There's lots of money in that restaurant. We went to happy hour because we could afford it. When I looked at the menu, I was like, mm, probably not anytime soon. You see? And then we went for a walk and people arriving in their big fancy yachts and, you know, tying up and going in and, and, McMarrell looked at each other and said, you know, if we didn't tithe, we could eat here. <laughs> but I don't think I'd be able to lift my hands up to him in worship. Indicated abundant surrender, because the second piece is sacrifice. I lay down my dreams. I lay down my wishes and wants. And I come to him with open hands and an open heart. And that is the transitionary point into the holy of holies. See, to them it was the high priest once a year. It's kind of a partial redemption, or at least a partial forgiveness. But what is on the table for us is that we can enter the holy of holies regularly. Worship is not a set of songs driven by a group of musicians. It's a posture of the heart where we bring our gifts and sacrifices to Him without holding anything back. And saying, you are worth it all. You are worth it all. When the gospel goes, he's not worth it. When the gospel goes, oh, I need my tithe because I've got to pay a bill. 
When the gospel goes, a sense of sacrifice is given away. No, 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 you know, that's too hard. Or as the Aussies will say, it's all too hard, mate. You know, it's all too hard. I can't sacrifice that because the gospel's gone. But when I'm in awe of your forgiveness and I'm, I, I, I stand there mystified that you will separate me from my sin as far as the east is from the west, that is a small sacrifice. For eight years, I hated L.A., leading a church in the San Gabriel Valley. Eight years, I pleaded with God, I don't fit in, I do not belong, nothing about me is an American Christian. And every Sunday, I'd have to get before him and sacrifice my dreams and my wills and my wants and minister and love on and care for a community I had nothing in common with. Gifts and sacrifices. When the gospel goes, we can do neither. The second big conversation here is the blood. It's very foreign to us. Imagine if I taught it this evening and they brought in a sheep here and I held the sheep's head back and I start talking about the sacrificial lamb and I slit the throat and then it bleeds out and with blood splattered all over me and blood coagulating on the ground and this, this bloody knife that I wave around as I talk. This is nuts, man. This is nuts. I want to go to Ralph's and get my, my meat. I, you know, I, I don't want this. It's so, so foreign to us. So how on earth can we make sense of any of this? Yeah. Have we got the pictures, Ty? Can we show them? What's interesting to me is that blood sacrifice has been there from the beginning. Ancient uh, civilization. There's the Aztecs, human sacrifice. The priests would slice open the chests of the sacrificial victims and offer their still beating hearts to the gods to keep the sun moving across the sky. Then they tossed the victims' lightless bodies, lifeless down the steps of the tower from antiquity. Another one, please, Rachel. The traditional Hawaiian human sacrifice. The motivation of the sacrifice could be demanded for the death of a chief or the construction of a home or the start of a war or the outbreak of a disease. The victims would be decapitated, strangled, drowned, bludgeoned, burned, crushed, etc. Why? Why? We think sometimes this is a purely Hebraic craziness. And so we can go on. Hindu sacrifice. We wanted not just Antiquity in terms of time, but geography in terms of all nationalities or all ethnicities. The Hindu sacrificial system, the sacrifice was made to Durga Puja, the goddess. The sacrificial animal offering is believed to stimulate a violent vengeance against the buffalo demon. Why? Genesis chapter 1. Uh, sorry, in Genesis chapter 3, Adam and Eve rebel against God. It's the first time in recorded text that blood is spilt. It says they were naked, they were fearful, and they were ashamed. And God killed an animal and made leather clothes for them, or wrap for them. That's the first time at the very dawn of the ages where there is a sacrificial lamb. Something had to be killed to cover our nakedness and to cover our sin. The next chapter, Abel and Cain. God warns Cain. He says, Cain, I want you to hear the sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must rule over it. He kills his brother, Cain does, and God says, your brother's blood cries out to me. Something is happening that's so very strange for a postmodern mind. It's a legal transaction. I remember as a kid, and please don't read more into it than the analogy. I remember as a kid watching cowboy movies. You remember with me? And then the cowboy would become a native or an or a Indian or a whatever is the right way to say it, buddy, buddy. And they take their knives and they cut their wrists and they let their blood mingle. Why? 
Is that something that we in our postmodern world just don't understand? Genesis 22, God asks Abraham to give his son on, on Mount Moriah as a sacrifice. That's super weird in a highly individualistic world. Can you imagine? My son is here. Can you imagine if he's seven years old and God says to me, I want you to take Tian to the tower on the top there. Take his heart out. To the ancient culture, that was not weird. Because the ancient culture, sometimes the idea of what's best for us is more important than what's best for me. Community was more important than individuality. We've lost that. Abraham doesn't pause for a moment. He doesn't negotiate with God and say, you crazy, you nuts. But God takes him to the very end. And then last text, and there are many. There's Exodus 12, when they paint blood on the doorways, and so on. But I just want to, for the sake of time, take you to one more text. You okay? Melanie, are you awake? She told me she was tired and hungry, so I said, well, if I... If I look at you and you're sleeping, I fail. Then I'm done. I'll say amen. So you still with me? Okay. Revelation 12 says something very interesting. It speaks about the enemy, Satan, the accuser of the brethren, etc., etc. It says, Then a loud voice said in heaven, Now salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ has come because... The accuser of the brethren. Who is he? He's the great dragon, the ancient serpent, the devil, the Satan, the accuser. Who accused them before our God day and night has been cast down. And they overcame him. Where where are you struggling? Where is there no overcoming? John tells us. And they overcame him three ways. Number one, they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb. Well, I appropriate the action of the, the, the blood of, of the lamb sacrifice. The second is, by the word of their testimony, I will not stop telling my story. I'm never embarrassed about telling a story some of you have heard for ten times over the four years. Because that's my victory. I'm not referring only to Abraham having to kill his son. But I can tell you my story when I fought with God. Your story has power. Your story builds faith. Your story gives courage. And they did not love their lives to the death. Doesn't matter what you do, Satan. I'm going to be obedient even if it costs me everything. You see, so the author of Hebrews says you must understand the tabernacle and there is a call deep to deep. Oh, beautiful, beautiful Genesis. I don't want us to relive Hillsong and they do great worship or Bethel and they do great worship. I want us to do us. And when that sweet sound and fragrance drifts its way into heaven, I want Jesus... Oh, hang on a second, hang on a second. Incense. Genesis is worshiping. He opens his eyes, and there's AJ on his knees, singing badly. I don't know if you sing badly, but I'm just going to say that. Flat, out of tune, rhythm poor, wrong key. Oh, what a fragrance that is. Hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on. There's Caleb. Caleb and his dog that looks like a mini-me, worshiping. See? See, that's what the tabernacle journey is. Deep calls to deep. And then he speaks about the blood. Jesus had to spill all of his blood, dear friends. I sat down over this week and thought, well, where did he spill his blood? The first is he was whipped. Remember in those days, it wasn't like today where there was someone guiding the conversation. And it wasn't like a cane that they used on us at school where they would walk up and they say, all right, I remember um, I got caned. I got three things because I had been chirping a first year woman teacher and and we thought it was fun to get her to cry so there was a group of us that worked her case she was our math teacher and we were not interested in maths at all and I feel dreadful today I mean I, I want to actually meet her and apologize maybe even repent but well maybe not repent just apologize and so we, we honestly did we looked to see if we could make her cry every every because it was a it was an all-boys school 
And our male master, we didn't know that, our teacher, stood on the corner outside, and he looked at us, and at the end of the class, he said, Vinant, and he named a few of us, and he said, come, come to my office. We knew what that was. It was part of the game. And in his corner, he had this tall kind of canister, and there was a range of canes. Mr. Vinant, would you like to choose it? Yes, sir. <laughs> and then you go there, and you choose, and he says, Mr. Vinant, I really think this is at least three. Yes, sir. It's the game. You get caught, you get beaten. That's it. Never thought of suing the guy. Never thought it was child abuse. It was the game. This is not that. This was a whip with stones and bones tied up to the end of it to create the most amount of damage and to create... Have you looked at some of those Muslim kind of things where they whip themselves and it's just a bloodied mess at the end? It's worse than that. And it says, by his stripes I am healed. By every lash that went across the back of Jesus, ripping his flesh open, creating this fountain of blood, is the source of my healing. They tortured him. They beat him. The crown of thorns. Again, not a cosmetic kind of Christian TV thing. It was raw, it was rugged, more like barbed wire that they pushed onto his head so that it stuck in his flesh. He had to carry that cross or that beam. If any of you have been in the army or hiked, do you know that what happens when your pack pack just doesn't fit well and you are bleeding through it all? That wasn't this. That was a massive beam that he carried across to the point where he collapsed. And Simon van Serien, it was an incredibly moving Afrikaans novel I read all those years ago, of the man who helped Jesus. And the blood continued to pour from a broken man. And then they nailed his feet. And I was just doing some research into it. It could have been through the ankles. Some crucifixions were either side of the, the up beam, where they drove a stake through the ankle or in the front and they would cross the feet and they would drive stakes in through there. Some of you have had a paper cut, you know, <laughs> you can believe. Nails in his hands or his wrists. Every ounce of his blood had to be spent, dear friend, for the blood to have its power. He didn't donate a pint And then in case there was any question or query whether the blood was all gone, the centurion said, stick a spear in his side, make sure. And when blood mingled with water, it meant there was no blood left. And he said, it is finished. Leviticus tells us, for the life of a creature is in the blood, and I have given it to you to make atonement for yourselves on the altar. It is the blood that makes atonement for one's life. Paul, Peter, John, Luke, I wish I could carry on and just talk to you about all of these authors who wrote about the blood and what the blood did. And what the blood does today. The tabernacle, the blood, and I land thirdly with the presence. If we go back to the text for a moment... And then we read verse 22, and then a little bit at the end, a chunk at the end. In fact, the law requires that nearly everything be cleansed with blood. And without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. The Aztecs knew that. The Hindus know that. The Muslims know that. Verse 24, for Christ did not enter a sanctuary made with human hands. That was only a copy of the true one who entered heaven itself. Now to appear for us in God's presence. Now to appear for us in God's presence. Nor did he enter heaven to offer himself again and again. The way the high priest enters the most high every year with the blood that is not his own. Otherwise Jesus would have to suffer many times since the creation of the world. But he appeared once for all. What a beautiful Phrase. He appeared once for all, the culmination of the ages, to do away with the sin by the sacrifice of himself. I'm sorry, 
I, I'm tempted to create humor, but it's too sober a moment. Just as people are destined to die once and after that to face judgment, so Christ is sacrificed once to take away the sins of many, and he will appear a second time, not to bear sin, but to bring salvation to those who are waiting for him. Last Sunday, Meryl, I think it was the best Meryl's ever taught. But she spoke about Jesus ever lives to make intercession for us. Can I remind you? Do not forget his benefits is what changed me. Who forgives me of all of my sins. I could not believe someone would want to do that. Who separates me from my sins as far as the east is from the west. And if that was not enough, he goes back to his father's side. He postures himself as the great intercessor, the one who stands in between. As if eternity could be a place of eternal rest for him. He postures himself in ongoing rep representation and he prays for me. Underneath me is the everlasting arms. Why have I not fell away 45 years or whatever the exact number is? Because underneath are the everlasting arms. And he lives to intercede. Father God knows me because of Jesus. He ever intercedes for me. You know, I hear people say things like, well, they don't believe anymore. Or they've walked away from their faith. It's a very, very strange language. I'm not asking you to believe what I believe. But I want to tell you, I didn't save me. Jesus did. I did not forgive my sins. Jesus did. I did not separate me from my sins as far as the east is from the west. Jesus did. I insufficiently pray to the Father for me, but Jesus does all the times. Underneath are the everlasting arms. It is not my white-knuckled ability to walk in marginal obedience that keeps me saved. It is Jesus. Are you saying, Chris, that you cannot lose your salvation? I don't know about you, but I know that's true for me. 100 percent. I am not capable of saving myself and keeping myself saved. I, I'm not. I'm too sinful. I'm too sinful. And how many sins is too much that I'm... Imagine if my, my, my T, who I am incredibly proud of, and there are things that he's done that's made us incredibly proud, and there are things he's done that's very, made us very unproud. But you know, I've never gone to him and said, Buddy, when you're performing well, you're a venant. But the moment you stop performing well, sorry, you're not a venant anymore. You're a shame to the family. No, he's just a really bad venant at that moment in time. He's still a venant. He's still got my blood in him. He's still my boy. Do you think my heavenly father who is slow to anger and abounding love is full of compassion and mercy is going to say, no, you've doubted. Sorry, buddy. You've gone through a deconstruction period. Sorry. Sorry, the blood doesn't apply to you anymore. I don't know, but that's not talking about my God in Psalm 103. As if God can just flippantly de-son or de-daughter us. I don't get that. I just don't get that. The prodigal son did about everything wrong. He forced his dad's hand, forced his dad to give him his inheritance too early, screwed up, spent the money, wasted the money with wine, woman, and song. We all know the story. And at the end of the day, it was the hearkening of the father's love that drew him back. And the picture in my ever prodigal mind is my cousin's farm. And on the farm patio is a rocking chair. Sometimes my uncle would sit on that at the end of the day and look at the maize fields, these endless acres of maize, corn. And there was a single road that I used to run every day down to the main road. When I think of the story, that's what comes to mind. 
that the prodigal son gets out of the bus where the farm road begins. And in stumbling weakness and overwhelming shame and the power of discouragement and awkwardness and brokenness, he starts the slow preamble back to the farmhouse. And the father gets off the patio where he was rocking with his cup of coffee. And the son looks up through the mists of the dust that always surrounds farmlands, expecting any moment either the father to see him, turn his back on him, and slam the farmyard door behind him. Or at least, best case scenario, he acknowledges him. But that's not what he sees, is it? Father stares for a moment, wondering, is it true? Is it real? And then he starts running. And now what he did to me, he started running for me. That's why I can't, for me, say, oh, well, I'll have a bad hair day and He'll wipe his hands with me and say, oops, you've lost your salvation. Bad luck, buddy. Now he's running from the patio for me, the prodigal son. One day there will be judgment. One day he will separate those who are eagerly waiting for him. And there will be judgment. And living in this ethereal world of spirituality where everyone will get saved. Ladies and gentlemen, that's just not true. Everyone will not get saved. Everyone will not have an eternal partnership and dwelling with Jesus. Everyone has not been covered by the blood of the Lamb. It says for those who were waiting for him. For those, that virgin who, who kept her, her, her lamp full so that when her master comes, she can light, light the fire. There is the end of the age. And the world will cease groaning, as Romans tells us. And he will return. And he will send his angels out to the four corners of the globe to bring to himself those who are his, who carry his mark. I don't buy into this. The mark of the beast will now be a, a um, you know, your credit card will be a chip in your arm for heaven's sake. Oh, let me have a look. Oh, you got a chip? Okay, hell. No chip? Okay, heaven. Vaccine? Or, oh, or, oh, not sure. The way some Christians act, it's a heaven or hell thing, for heaven's sake. Have the damn vaccine. <laughs> way more important things to deal with. Eternal things, things that matter. There is a mark of the beast. It's not a credit card. It's those who worship him on their forehead. They think about him and obey him. On their hands, they do the things he obligates them to do. In the same way that the mark of Jesus are those who are preoccupied with what he says and are absorbed by what he asks us to do. That's it. What a great day. Of rejoicing that will be. Would you bow your heads with me please? Every time I read that passage. Psalm 103. I'm struck in wonder and in awe. Why would you do it for me? The gospel does not tire in its beauty and its wonder and its mystery. Because I'm forever reminded I am a broken man that is in need of salvation. Not once. He did it once for all. But I am being saved. Come on home, prodigal. Come on home. 
Look up from the awkwardness and the shamefulness of your sin and iniquity and see the father drop his coffee and leave the patio and come running for you. The gospel is good news. Just let the musicians sing over us. We've got a little bit of time. Let the truth of this evening's message just find its way into your heart afresh.